and has come back. Anyway, welcome. Let's go ahead and begin this fabulous webinar. And today we're going to be talking about ASL phonetics uh, regarding literacy. And we have our um, core curriculum, that's uh, curriculum outreach, uh, core education. And hello, my name is Jack. I will be your host for this webinar. And I am part of the outreach team. So I wanted to invite our um, curriculum specialist, and that will be Kate. And uh, she is the literacy coach and um, literacy coach and uh, coordinator. And we also have Julie Seppa, and she is the uh, literacy specialist for K through 12. And both of these women are really just amazing. And we're really thrilled to have their expertise in literacy and in teaching and to share their knowledge with you. Uh, this webinar, uh, we've had topics that we have provided uh, since 2020 and just all, it's just really universal uh, schools for the deaf uh, programs and different, uh, different settings, mainstream, um, settings, uh, School for the Deaf. And we are really proud to be a leading provider for resources for all of you to use and to share and to uh, take advantage of. So this will be a recorded session. And for me, I am going to be working on these recordings and editing them. And we will be including a Spanish recording as well. And once that is all done, we will distribute those and you feel free to share those with your deaf agencies, other LEAs, um, share them with your teachers, share them with your families. Um, so anyway, okay, now I wanted to switch over to, uh, we have a Spanish interpreter here and I just wanna make sure that he has a chance to explain to our Spanish families what to do to access this in uh, Spanish. So Juan, if you could go ahead and um, make that explanation to our Spanish families. Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so we will move uh, right along and we just wanna make sure that this pacing is uh, set at a pace that we can access this in both languages. We have a presenter that will be signing in ASL. We have an interpreter that will be uh, speaking uh, in English uh, spoken language. And we have about 10 videos uh, that we'll be showing the first one, the whole thing, will just be uh, spoken, but uh, we will have an interpreter. Um, and then the second through the 10th, we will have some captioning uh, and you can just watch it, um, whether you're deaf or hearing, you can access that captioning. And we'll have little parts in between that are uh, signed, um, you know, talk about rhyming and such, uh, and the interpreter will be voicing for those parts. Okay, so, Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Kate and Julie. Okay, so hi everybody. Hello. Um, I am Kate and I'm gonna go ahead and start. You will, you might see me looking back and forth between two screens. So just wanted to let you know my slideshow is on my other screen. So please bear with me. Okay, so uh, now I want to discuss what ASL phonetics, pho phonology is, excuse me. Um, that is what, this, this is the sign we use for phonology. Kids who are hearing and use sound, that sign is phonology at the ear, a P at the ear. But because we sign, we use it at the hand, the P at the hand. So if you, if you see this sign, you, need, you know that that's what that means. So... Phonology in general, the, dic the dictionary definition um, tends to, you know, the, the definition associates with sound. 
so people sometimes are a little confused as to how deaf students you know, can read and how, how do they learn to read if they don't have access to sound or maybe just have minimal access to sound and how that works. So <clears throat> we are going to discuss that. Now, CCMS, Common Core State Standards, CCSS in California, uh, they have emphasized, again, hearing in their standards. Rhyming words, sounds, you see those uh, words in standards, particularly in kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Now we have kinder and first in this, uh, in this slide that you're seeing right now. Okay, so uh, anyway, sound and phonics, word recognition, all of those are through sound, access through sound and uh, phonetics as well. I'm sorry, phonics. Uh, even out on our state testing, the SBAC, that's the state, uh, the smart balance assessment, Consultorium, that testing is through speech and hearing. That's what we see in all of our standardized testing. And that red arrow is pointing to hearing, as you can see. So, okay, so we know what that means in hearing children. So what does that mean in ASL? So I'm gonna show a series of ASL videos that will hopefully give you a better picture of what ASL phonology looks like and how to use that with your deaf students um, so that they can become better readers in the future. Now this woman uh, is Dr. Deborah uh, missed the last name, I'm sorry, with uh, a center in Gallaudet, uh, in the, at the Clark Center in Gallaudet. And she is talking about the building blocks of language itself and what does that look like. So it's just a real quick one minute video. So this is an expl explanation of linguistics and the acquisition of language. Phonology means uh, form, sounds, and how they group to become words. Language then becomes a uh, sign, so that's the form. Next, we have lexicon, which means vocabulary words, how they learn that vocabulary. Next, we have morphology, meaning words are split into parts, and each part will have a specific meaning, and that is applied to language. Next, we have syntax, and that is basically a word order that is chained to become uh, sentences. And we have rules in uh, each language, whether it's spoken or signed language. Uh, and we have discourse, which is the combination of all of those sentences and, and how we organize all of that. So just a re quick recap, basically we know that, you know, the foundations of what pho phonology is, um, I'm sorry, uh, the, we start from the basics and then we build up from there to create an entire language. So she had mentioned uh, parameters of sign and we typically, we have five hand shapes, we have palm orientation, meaning just where your hand is located in space, movement. Then we have a uh, location. So, you know, that's where, where you put your hand and then non-manual markers. That's like your, your facial expressions, your eyebrows how they move. So those are the five parameters that we'll talk about. And we'll also add in finger spelling and rhyming. And those, those two are also part of phonology. And we will touch on each one of those um, points today. 
So with the, oh, I want to expand on a little bit the uh, Common Core system that we just talked about. Um, we have developed an ASL standard uh, that parallels with that through Gallaudet. And this is the website uh, about that. The ASL content standards, there is a list um, that runs parallel with our CCSS tests and anything that relies on spoken language or hearing is run parallel, but in sign language. And so you can watch, um, it's, it's with viewing and then express an expressive language. So whatever you would read, we would view through sign language and then whatever you would write as a hearing uh, child, we would express through sign language. So it does run parallel. And so it's just a nice collaboration that we have and anyone can have access to these ASL standards. Uh, for example, one of them is related to ASL phonetics. And one of those is finger spelling and finger reading. Most people have not seen that word, but we know when we finger spell, but when the person is looking at us reading that, that becomes finger reading, right? So, um, so I'm gonna show a short video here, which explains how that would work with the ASL standards. Okay, so as she, I'm gonna summarize what she talked about um, with these standards. So for example, finger spelling. Now, how would you use finger spelling and what does that look like? And that's according to grade level and what is appropriate for a student to have uh, as far as skills, uh, what, what uh, skills they should, um, be mastered by their uh, grade level. And you can go ahead and look at the website. There's a lot of information there and you can click on which grade and what, what kind of skills they should have um, mastered by that point. It's very user-friendly. So with the research that we have been doing in the last several years, and we've done presentations at different places, um, explaining about this subject, we've developed three videos that um, we've kind of uh, cut from this first video. And this one is captioned as well that I would like to show you guys. And so we're gonna watch it now. Uh, the reason I wanted to show you this one is because it's very a clear explanation and you can see some examples, uh, especially with our deaf students and how um, this can apply to them. So I thought that this was a really good example uh, to kind of give you an idea of what that means for our students. Lo que sabemos y lo que hemos visto es que hay una correlación entre, entre el lenguaje de ciencia americano e inglés. Y queremos asegurarnos de que reconocemos ese patrón. 
que muestra que tiene que el lenguaje de señas americano tiene su propia fonología y un ritmo de señas. Y toda la exposición es muy, muy importante. Entonces, eh, quiero darles un ejemplo para que ustedes puedan algo así como entender cómo luce. Entonces, supongamos que tenemos un niño que está escuchando. Entonces, cuando escuchamos la palabra cat, Pero dentro de esa palabra cat vienen algunas complejidades, ¿verdad? Hay unos fonemas, tienen el, favor, excusen el intérprete, el ritmo y todo eso en solo una palabra cat. Entonces, es una palabra muy cargada, ¿verdad? Pero aprendimos cómo simplemente tomar todo eso, tomar toda esa información y hacerla solo normal para nosotros. Entonces, ¿cómo luce eso en cada una de las categorías? Los ponemos para alguna persona en K-Sound. Viene con ese sonido K. Si hubiera otra palabra, Okay, so now we have orthography. And that is that specific sound for the, it, you can see this uh, in the slide. It's how each particular sound in the word cat is made, the K, the K, A, and T. Um, and the, This is how they know it's not bat or it's not mat. And syllables, cat is only one syllable, right? And what you see on the face, most of the time uh, for hearing people, they may not be looking at the person's face when they're talking. Uh, maybe they're just depending on hearing, but There are mouth movements. When you say cat and bat, those mouth movements look different. And how that word is spoken sounds differently. Now I want to show you the same thing, cat, but with ASL. So now we have a picture. We're going to picture an orange cat. You know, we use background knowledge. That's what this person knows. This person is envisioning an orange cat. So how are, there are some similarities, but there are some differences. So this is very visual. Um, so you can, you can see, obviously this is a signed word. It's not accessed through hearing. You use your hands and or, and or finger spelling. So the word cat ha in ASL has a movement, has a hand shape, or you could, you could finger spell it or you could use the sign. If I finger spelled cat, you can see the movement of the finger spelling. It stays on the same level. Like when you, what you would picture the written word cat, it's on the same line, the same, plane in space. So when I finger spell cat, but if I spelled bat, like a tall, the B is a taller letter. So the B from the A goes down, goes down B, A, and then T is also small. So big, small, small. And so if you saw the word book, right, you would see two tall letters in B and K at the ends while the O's are small. So you would see big, small, small, big. And that shape of the word, it's kind of an envelope of what the word is. So for the word cat and the word bat, those look different and, and as well as the word book. 
So that's what we call the envelope. So cat is very quick to spell, C-A-T, it's very natural. And you might not realize this, but you, you know, you notice how many syllables are in a word sometimes because, um, you know, chunks or how, you know, the length of the word itself. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more with Julie when um, she does her presentation. But anyway, the word cat is one syllable, right? There's no pause or anything in between that word. So what you see on the hand, uh, the finger spelling, C-A-T, that is the articulation. So it is complex, but once you internalize that, it becomes very natural and normal. It's the same thing as your receptive hearing skills. It's the same thing in ASL as your receptive, you know, uh, language skills, understanding ASL. So in both these modalities... In ambos estas modalidades, el niño podría lucir diferente, pero ellos básicamente tienen la misma información. Aún así tienen la misma palabra gato. Entonces cuando viene a ese punto, a ese input, a esa entrada en el cerebro, es importante entender cómo eso funciona. Eso se llama lenguaje visual. En la ciudad de Washington, en esa universidad, se llama lenguaje visual. Ellos han hecho investigaciones en el cerebro y la doctora Laura y Catito, ella es de Canadá y ella hizo algunas investigaciones que les voy a mostrar, un, de las cuales les voy a mostrar un, un video que es realmente maravilloso lo que ellos encontraron. Y tiene subtítulos.
Okay, so it is fascinating research and it proves what, you know, really this pattern that the brain is looking for, it doesn't matter if you hear or sign. So the important thing is just exposure. So I've made a list here, basically um, two languages um, fosters more languages, third, fourth, fifth languages. Some families are um, speak multiple languages at home. And if you wanna expose children to multiple languages, I, that's great. So um, if you understand a concept in ASL, it's easier to tr uh, transfer that concept in uh, English. And that's um, Cummins theory. And that has been proven to be true. Um, it's not just, it's a, not a monolingual um, concept. It's, it's, it can be transferred to multiple languages. So if teachers or families with children, um, what can you do? Um, I'm going to cover four different points. So let me set this up. Okay. So hand shape is one location finger spelling and rhythm. So those are some easy things to incorporate in your lesson plans, your activities at home, and how you speak with your child. They're very easy to incorporate it. And I'll give you some examples so that you can have an idea of what to do. I'm gonna start with hand shapes. So with hand shapes, there are all kinds of different possibilities that you could do. You could do poems, you could do some stories, use numbers in those stories. Uh, you could use, you know, one to five, if you want to make them more complex, one to 15. You could do ABC stories. Um, you could do them with their names, stories with their names. These are the most basic hand shapes that are typically used, the five, B, A, S, C, O, and one. And those are the easiest for the babies and young children to use. So we use those most commonly, uh, these hand shapes with the young children. So this is a shorter video, but I do wanna show you it. It's about hand shapes. So this is a, a hand shape, uh, a story using one hand shape. Pig, house, comfortable house. Gliding down a road, driving down a road, bus down a road. Stop, stop, stop. Using different hand shapes. This is uh, using different hand shapes to convey the idea of bumpy. This is using different hand shapes to convey the idea of turning.
Okay, so these are some examples that we use with hand shapes and it's pretty neat. <clears throat> Kids really enjoy those games. It's a real fun part of uh, storytelling with hand shapes. Uh, now we're gonna talk about location. And this is a uh, more recent, uh, a little bit newer, but it's a fun activity that I did wanna show. Um, this can relate to dancing, poem, storytelling, but the location is about where the sign is in space. And this is gonna be a, a summary of the explanation of it. So um, location starts on the top, uh, like where the forehead is and then goes out. Um, so we're gonna give you some examples of this as well. Notice the colors of the background here. The red and orange. Oh, I'm sorry. Boy looking light out. Boy looking light scared. Police sirens gone. Boy looking, looking light scared. Sun comes up light. So we started at the forehead, then the chin, chest, hands, and then outward. So you can find different signs to kind of try and make a story. Um, and the kids are just really fascinated with that. Uh, another quick example, but you see the colors, if you notice uh, red is up here, orange is in the chest, I'm, I'm sorry, the chin, then yellow, green, blue, and purple is outward. So they move um, from the forehead, chin, chest, and out. Horse. Pig. Yellow. Green. So it's nice how that all, so what the kids will memorize the colors and then they know where it is on their bodies. And that concept is easy to transfer to other signs. And you can post something like this in your room or at home on the wall. And this is kind of what we use here. So uh, you can see this is color coded, red, orange, yellow, blue, purple. And that is where this uh, is related to where the signs are. Dad, cow, summer, those are all on the forehead. So we'll, we group them and the students are more likely to remember 
Uh, it's kind of like a word wall. Those are nice. But sometimes like with ABCs, those letters, if you like if you have dad, you would put that in D. If you have summer that goes way over there in S. Um, so that's a little bit confusing because those are different letters and sometimes the kids get confused as to where that sign is in relation to their body. There's no, you know, you know, when you say dad or summer, you don't have anything to, to, to remember that by. But if you do it by location, it's easier for them to remember. So this is kind of what it looks like in class. And the kids just kind of add words as they go along, as they learn, and they just add as they go. So I'm gonna turn it over to Julie. We have about 10 minutes, so I'm gonna let Julie take over and do her part. And hold on while the interpreter switches over and fixes the screen, one second. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Julie. It's nice to see you all here. And as Kate mentioned, one second. <clears throat> Sorry, I just wanna make sure I could see the interpreter. Um, so as Kate mentioned, we have hand shapes, we have location, and now I'm gonna talk about finger spelling and rhythm. Those two are very important to include in the home for children or at school for the students. So I wanted to talk about one very common mistake or concept that seems like everybody thinks that finger spelling means that that replaces a word that just doesn't have a sign, but that's not true. There are, we finger spell sign, finger spell words that do have signs, and we'll talk about that. So if you notice, um, we have natural finger spelling for words. For example, my name is Julie. If you notice the J-U-L-I-E, that the the movement of my hands the way I just did it doesn't look natural but the way I do it just now like zoo and zoo it's important to recognize natural versus not natural and we also have abbreviations for example the word apartment we tend to just say apt another example is ref or for refrigerator but there are signs for that we also have um social worker sw board of trustees b B to T, but we use it in a sign. These are very common in our deaf community. Um, these are signs like, for example, the word bank. Instead of spelling very clearly out each letter, B-A-N-K, it's a movement that looks like a sign, early, early. It looks like a sign, but you're spelling each letter. <clears throat> so it's important to understand that we have syllables in finger spelling, and you could see that in the finger spelling. For example, the state of Mississippi. You'll notice these little chunks. Now, it's important to know that it's not the same as in English. Often we use chunks, and those are recognized as syllables. So a common question that we get often is when, when can deaf children pick up finger spelling? When do they start that? You know, is it soon as, you know, as soon as a deaf baby is born, they can start signing almost right away and they can start finger spelling. You know, the day that they open their eyes and can see, they can't really express that until they're about eight months old. And finger spelling starts by about one year old. Now it's not sophisticated finger spelling. It's gonna look like gibberish, but it's not wrong. It's the same as hearing babies who babble and so on. That's because their brains are starting to figure stuff out, starting to figure out language. It starts out very simple and then becomes more complex and sophisticated as they grow. So, uh, you know, young babies can sign like B, S, mom, you know, for water they will, and, and then it'll become, they might get confused, like for P, they'll sign the, the letter K. Um, 
but as they talk and their everyday conversations and they become older, just the same as hearing children do, their language will become more sophisticated. So I wanna watch a video. This is very fascinating and a true story. Let's go ahead and watch this video. So I wanted to discuss uh, this concept of sandwiching. It's very common. That's where you spell a word, sign it, and then spell it again, or vice versa. You can sign a word, spell it, and then sign it again. And that builds up a uh, their uh, cognitive abilities to kind of file more vocabulary and more acqui language acquisition. And I wanted to show you an example of that right now. You see, she signs and then spells. That's much. Go, spell, sign, spell, spell. This concept of chaining is very, very important. Now, for example, um, if a child sees the word cat spelled and then the sign and then a picture, then we add maybe a, a video and then a book of the word cat. So all of these concepts are very important to chain that concept. And then that will allow the child to become a better and more strong, uh, a stronger reader in the future. So for example, in the classroom during maybe a science experiment, you could do uh, like spell baking soda, show them the actual baking soda, spell it again, baking soda. Um, and then just make those make those uh, occurrences more natural with a visual and um, and different experiences with that word. So rhythm is a fun way to include uh, language in your classroom and at, and in home. Uh, we are pretty pressed for time, so we're going to go ahead and skip a part of this. Um, yeah, we're going to go ahead and show this part.
these are just some examples of rhythm that I wanted to show. So the point of this, this, this rhythm, uh, the more you do that in your home, in your classroom, it's catchy, it's fun, it's exciting. And that repetitiveness includes the, inc increases um, that student's exposure to the word and increases their knowledge. And there's evidence that that increases their uh, literacy by doing, by playing with language and you can do it by themselves with friends, with their parents. It's very beneficial um, with their uh, development um, because the more exposure and the earlier that exposure, um, the better the results. And we have evidence of that that will improve their reading and writing skills in the future. So this slide, we're going to talk about uh, visual um, attention and um, early acquisition. And the secret to that is start early. So this is very, very important. This is key. Just repeat, repeat, repeat. Your brain is like a sponge, just absorbs all of this information and the earlier the better, just as much as possible. Now we have some tips for parents and for teachers, some you know supervisors, anybody. I wanted to real quick show a video um, of how we can support everyone out there with our rich resources. And Kate, can you please show our core learning channel, for example? This is, uh, something that anyone can access. There's no fee you have to pay or anything. All of this is available. And we often add to this every day. Um, Kate, can you do the Latin, Latinx uh, Hispanic resources? So we have a long list of videos from uh, everywhere. They're all signed, some are hearing, some are deaf, and there's a resource accessibility. Sometimes we might not have um, a person to come in person, but we have a variety of different um, resources and that we really think that will benefit your child to kind of see. You would kind of really have to look at it to really um, appreciate the value of it. So I encourage you to check that out. And like I mentioned, we will send out the PowerPoint. And so you can click on the uh, core channel and access all of these. And so again, uh, I wanted to thank you for uh, coming to watch this presentation and you can access this uh, presentation at a later time. We'll send that out to you. And if anyone has any questions, I'm wondering if we have any questions left. I, I'm sorry, any questions, any uh, time left for questions, Jack? Okay, Jack here. Hi. So uh, thank you so much for all of your time. Um, we will, like you said, we're going to work out this PowerPoint. We're going to put all of that together. We'll do the captioning and we will share all of that with you. And yes, um, 
uh, we will share that um, for all everybody who has registered. We'll put that on there and you can use that in the future. And we want to thank everyone for participating today. And we're sorry about earlier. We had some issues with um, the technology. We'll have to figure that out for next time. But thank you for your patience and have a wonderful weekend. And until next time, thank you so much for our presenters and our interpreters. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great day.